Cancer Center. And I'm delighted to introduce our speaker today, uh, Dean Sten Vermont, who is the Dean of the Yale School of Public Health. We've been here just over a year now. Um, and Dr. Vermont is a pediatrician and a infectious disease epidemiologist and did some of the um, or, you know, original initial groundbreaking research focused on cervical cancer screening and embedding it with HIV um, testing screening initiatives back in the 1990s. Uh, your training was at Stanford, um, Albert Einstein in Columbia with a stint in London as well, right? And we are very fortunate to have him here um, at Yale uh, leading our school public health and also many programs and initiatives in the Yale Cancer Center. So today, specifically talking about cervical cancer screening. Thank Thanks, you. Melinda. Great pleasure to be here and happy to be a proud member of the Cancer Center myself. Um, Melinda mentioned that, uh, that I got involved with um, uh, sort of the issues of HPV, HIV interactions. It was actually in the 80s. Uh, and uh, we uh, made a very simple observation that uh, women who were immunosuppressed might be at higher risk of cervical cancer. Nothing unusual about that, given that we knew that women who'd had um, transplants were at higher risk of cervical cancer, women who were on immunosuppressive drugs were at higher risk of cervical cancer. Cervical cancer was often a second primary after treatment of a first cancer with the immunosuppressive therapy. So, you know, I was young. I wasn't asking any particularly original questions, but I thought maybe HIV would increase risk of cervical cancer. And then I read a letter to the editor in The Lancet in 1987 where a, uh, an OBGYN uh, had six cases of young women, including a teenager, who'd had normal pap smears six months later, had uh, CIN3 or invasive cervical cancer, uh, and they all had HIV. And then I said, aha, I'm on to something, wrote my first successful grant, uh, and was off to the races. So that's how an infectious disease epidemiologist got involved in cancer epidemiology. Uh, and uh, by the way, I just finished taking a course at, the, at IARC on uh, molecular biology for the cancer epidemiologist because uh, having done my med school in the 70s and then having done peds training in, in, in epidemiology, that was the a decade of the revolution in molecular biology. And I could no longer pick up science or, or nature and understand what they were saying. It was too technical. So I took this two-week course, which was focused on cancer epidemiologists, but I, I needed the same training. And, uh, and then, and, you know, forged an alliance with Robbie Burke, uh, who was doing HPV molecular biology, and I was the epidemiologist. We had our Cy Romney and other clinicians, and we were able to do a, what I think was a reasonably important body work at the time. Now, you all know this, that HPV virology and carcinogenicity ties into the epidemiology of cervical cancer. I don't know if you, you know, a handful of you, maybe Vince and others, remember Irv, Irv uh, Kessler's work from Pittsburgh and he thought for sure it was HSV. So he was, he was aware that this behaved like a, you know, cervical cancer behaved like a, an STD, uh, but he had the wrong virus. And he had a whole body of work with sort of odds ratios of 2.0. And then HPV came along with odds ratios of 20. <laughs> so he, he just was studying a confounder. And, and, uh, and just we did, it was before... Uh, Zurhausen and, and the revolution in HPV diagnostics, which opened up this whole field for somebody like me to walk into. And of course, we we're very uh, preoccupied with our clinical practice and screening issues, uh, ties into global health issues, which make it more complex to do the kind of screening we take for, uh, for granted in high income countries. And you quickly get into the area of health services research and disparities. So, you know, HPV and cancer have all these links. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this slide other than to remind you uh, that, you know, when you get HPV, uh, you can clear it, uh, you can retain it, you can progress to mild abnormalities, you can progress, you can actually regress, uh, you can uh, uh, progress to invasive cancers, can take decades and can take uh, years or even months if you're immunosuppressed, so that accelerates the pro pro process, uh, pathogenic process. 
And there are all these behavioral factors, uh, issues of innate immunity. We really have put a question mark. We're really not sure. Uh, the adaptive immune system silencing that's been speculated and some evidence for it leading to viral persistence and what turns on that silencing mechanism. What about certain types of immunosuppression turn that on and other types don't seem to affect it. Um, and, uh, and, and of course, viral-viral interactions. Maybe Irv Kessler was right. Maybe if you have HSV co-infection, it accelerates. These are still open questions. Um, and uh, when you think about the USA, before we get to Africa, the CDC cervical cancer screening guidelines uh, were modified, uh, pap smear twice in the first year after diagnosis of H P HIV. Uh, and, uh, and if both are within normal limits, they say yearly is good enough. And, uh, and even with low-grade ASCUS, you uh, are recommended to do uh, more definitive diagnostics. That's, that's basically the difference between uh, the HIV-infected woman versus somebody else. And one could extrapolate and think that the immunosuppressed woman might want to get something similar, a little bit more aggressive uh, monitoring and evaluation. Um, but why do we still have uh, five to 6,000 uh, cervical cancer, invasive cervical cancer cases in the U.S.? Well, it's the rarely or never screened women who are at much, much higher risk. So we're talking about racial and ethnic minorities. For a long time, we had uh, especially high rates among uh, Alaskan natives who often lived in remote rural areas who basically never got screened. Uh, we've improved on that a lot in recent years. Lower socioeconomic status and a very important group, the foreign born, particularly immigrants who have been living in the U.S. less than 10 years, some of whom are somewhat alienated from primary care either because of undocumented status or just lack of familiarity with preventive health care systems. Their, their culture from their countries is you go to the doctor when you're sick. You don't go to the doctor when you're well. Uh, and then, of course, the uninsured. Uh, and uh, there are a lot of evidence for this, and the talk is about Africa, so I'm shortcutting this part of it. Um, here from Kaiser uh, in Northern California, you have the circumstance of mostly a working you know, population, otherwise they don't get Kaiser access. And uh, it really was overwhelmingly women who had never had a pap smear who were uh, overrepresented in the cervical cancer group. Uh, and then uh, false negative uh, pap smears and then f uh, positive pap smear but failure to follow up uh, uh, represents, you know, 100% of these cases. So in some ways, modern cervical cancer is uh, a matter of um, doing what we have to do for vaccines, which is maintain our standards and maintain our coverage at a high level, and then go for the 2%, 1% of the population that is in this category of never screened, low, low health care access, low awareness. So it's very much uh, the social determinants of cervical cancer are dominating, really, our, our agenda now. It's not so much a a technical issue that, 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 that holds us back from progress in the U.S., but very much a sociological one. And you could, uh, the Swiss cheese I borrowed from Connie Trimble at Johns Hopkins with her permission, and healthcare providers don't screen. And, uh, well, sorry, here, women do not come in for screening, number one problem. If they come in, the healthcare provider doesn't screen, so the so-called missed opportunity, where somebody came in with a, an acute care complaint, but they've never had a pap smear, and the primary care doctor doesn't think about a pap smear when they're here for the common cold or some such. Um, the colposcopy wasn't done either because the woman didn't come for a follow-up visit or there was some mistake in the healthcare system. Um, uh, the patient isn't appropriately treated, and that happens every once in a while, and that's where you get your cervical cancers. So let's go global, and from global can, uh, the data are typically lagged by about five years, and sure enough, I checked this a few days ago, and this is the latest, 2012. And uh, not surprisingly, um, uh, uh, Sub-Saharan Africa, which often lights up most of our slides in terms of uh, prevalence of a variety of uh, important diseases, is most notable uh, the Andean region, uh, uh, parts of the Caribbean, Central America, uh, are the hot spots. And uh, if you look at India, it doesn't light up the highest uh, frequency, but just think of the population of India uh, with over a billion people. So you can imagine the largest burden of cervical cancer in the world is, in fact, in India, 
even if it's not the highest rate. Now, since I'm going to be talking about Zambia, and uh, I'll just mention Mozambique in passing, uh, which is where I uh, did most of the work that I'm going to tell you about today, um, this, was, uh, uh, this wasn't my term. This, was, this came from Global Can, Global Cervical Cancer Crisis Table. And if you look at this, um, the mortality rates are the highest in the world, uh, with Malawi, which is practically the same country, just separated by an arbitrary border, uh, same language, same ethnic groups. Uh, Tanzania, which is just a, a short distance away, Uganda, Mozambique, Zimbabwe, Mali, Ghana, Rwanda, Nigeria, these are the highest in the world. And um, I've worked uh, extensively in Zambia and then subsequently in Mozambique. Uh, if you look at Zambia, um, in the Cancer Diseases Hospital of Zambia, which is actually relatively new, they didn't have a cancer uh, diseases hospital until the uh, first lady two presidents ago was a physician. She was the former chairman of the Department of OBGYN at the University of Zambia, and her husband, uh, President Sata, uh, uh, took, uh, took the presidency, was elected president of Zambia, and she took cancer as her first lady's activity sort of the way Michelle Obama took activity and, uh, and, uh, and ironically, uh, Mrs. Trump has taken bullying. Um, but in any case, uh, this is, uh, this is uh, what she did, and she helped create the Cancer Disease Hospital uh, of Zambia. And you'll see that a whopping 35% uh, of the cases in that hospital are cervical cancer, every single one of which is a public health failure, every single one of which should never have appeared in this hospital. So you, this is where I've gotten my passion for this topic uh, because of the immense, how do I put this, I'll put it, the immense delta between where we are and where we should be. And you know, if you work in an area of immense delta, you can have a very satisfying career because even a small improvement in circumstances, you just see such massive benefit. And uh, I think that's something that attracts some of us to public health and some of us to global health, is that we can struggle mightily in the U.S. to improve our cancer services. And at the end of the day, we're going to go from, you know, a survival of 76 years to 76.2, and that's a good thing. And for a particular cancer, it might be a great thing. But if you're working in Africa and you've got, uh, you know, um, uh, life expectancies of 40, 42, 45, you may be able to make contribution that can be that much more uh, impactful. So this is, uh, and, and you, I'm sorry, I meant, I meant to dwell on this just for you to see some of the other diseases and some of their frequencies as well. So uh, we know that uh, cervical cancer is almost completely preventable by screening an HPV vaccine. Um, where you don't have uh, cytopathologists or pathologists, we have been using visual inspection with acetic acid, and I'll talk about, about that in a minute. And uh, we kind of know what to do in a clinic setting. If the woman is there and you have the resources, we know what to do. But how do we bring such programs to scale in real-world settings to get the women who are not in your clinic? Um, let me just say, since uh, Zambia has one of the worst AIDS epidemics in the world, I think it ranks uh, seventh among countries, or sixth, um, uh, and globally, we have over 30 million uh, women uh, uh, who are infected with HIV, uh, uh, sorry, 30 million persons infected, half of whom are women, 80% of whom are in low-resource settings. And uh, now you have something that I couldn't have said 20 years ago, which is now you have widespread access, your tax dollars at work, through the U.S. President's Emergency Plan for AIDS Relief, otherwise known as PEPFAR. And that was started by George W. Bush in 2003 with broad bipartisan support. Now, for the young people in the audience, bipartisan support means you have Democrats and Republicans agreeing on something and working in a common fashion. So you'll have to read the history books about what bipartisanism means. But, uh, uh, um, and, and this has been supported by uh, President Obama. And President Trump wanted to cut it 30 percent, but Congress didn't let him, and so we continue providing um, the largest health program in global history, which is PEPFAR, dwarfing programs like polio eradication, smallpox eradication, 
the expanded program of immunizations at the WHO. You know, this is, this is a good $8 billion a year just coming from the U.S. government, not to even mention what's coming from other governments. So it, we have massively improved antiretroviral therapy. Got a long way to go, but, but uh, uh, literally at this point, more than a million lives saved. Now, on the cervical cancer side, more than half a million cases a year, quarter million deaths. So this ratio is all screwed up, right? I mean, if we were catching these cases as early as we do in the Western world, in the high-income world, we wouldn't have half of them dying, but we catch them late. And a uh, whopping 84% low-resource nations, which tells you why this ratio is so bad. And it ranks number one or two most common cancer in women in low- and middle-income countries. So, uh, you know, that's, that shows you this preventable, and I showed you the Zambia data where overwhelming was the, was the number one. Some, some countries' breast is, is actually number one. Um, this is one of the very first papers we published from our, our Lusaka work, uh, and uh, we did a, the simplest study on the face of the planet. We took 150 HIV-infected women, and we did pap smears on all of them. And we could not believe these results. This was terrifying, absolutely terrifying, because these were women who were there for HIV. They weren't there for some kind of gynecologic com uh, complaint. And n uh, half of them either had cancer, almost all, of, I say suggestive because I'm a conservative writer, but virtually all these people had ICC, and then high-grade SIL, half of them. And, and, and a, a paltry 6%, if you want to include the ASCUS, uh, um, um, you know, 23% uh, were in this category. You do a random sample of 150 women in Africa, it's not going to look like this. And certainly 150 women in the U.S., it's not going to look even remotely like, like this. You're going to have zero here, you're going to have one here, and everybody else is going to be in this category. So we knew we were onto something, and um, we sort of knew that from our New York City work, uh, that we would, we would find a, a, a large yield. And, you know, there are uh, differences in cervical cancer screening guidelines. Women without HIV, women with HIV, um, they want to start screening as soon as someone's sexually active if you have HIV. Um, annual PAPs, uh, and I mentioned earlier two negative PAPs and then annual. Uh, and then uh, not much guidance on when to discontinue PAPs. Most people say never if you have HIV. And, uh, and same guidelines for hysterectomy and same guidelines for HPV vaccination. So ultimately, uh, we want to be more aggressive with these women. Now, challenges with current cervical cancer screening practices, you know, uh, you overwhelm your clinical service if you're in Lusaka, Zambia, and you're screening for HIV. You have a lot of women with uh, disease, and you don't have enough clinicians to evaluate the disease, and you don't have enough pathologists to evaluate the biopsies. So we had to deal with that, and I'll mention that in a moment. Um, colposcopy and biopsy that are conducted unnecessarily are of great expense to the health system. We absorb that expense here, where we're evidently happy to pay 18 percent of our gross national product on health. But uh, in Zambia, where it's uh, more like uh, 6 percent, and their gross national product is small, you know, you're talking about relative investments that could be 500 to 1. You know, we're spending $500 in health care for every one they're spending, so it's a much bigger burden there. And you do have risks uh, uh, in terms of unnecessary procedures and uh, theoretical overtreatment harm. So we needed to be uh, conscious of, uh, of these issues. And, you know, with cytology-based screening, you just don't, nobody's giving you the money to do this. Nobody is giving you the money to capacitate Zambia or Malawi or Tanzania or, for that matter, India with the kind of pap smear infrastructures that we have today. And even in the U.S., Papa Nicolau published, uh, did his work and published it uh, sort of quietly in the 1920s, and it didn't really take off until 20 years later, the famous monograph in the 1940s. So it, it, there's an uptake problem even in the U.S.'s history and you can imagine in an environment where you just don't have a, a trained healthcare workforce, you have no cadre of cytotechnologists, pathologists are very rare. Through our entire program in Zambia in the early noughts, uh, 2000, 2005 roughly, when we got this thing off the ground, we were dealing with one pathologist. There was one pathologist at the University of Zambia. Now I think there are four. And they probably need 40 just for that university teaching hospital. And we had one, one guy. Um, 
a very well-trained guy, mercifully, but still very problematic. Low coverage rates, not surprising, and massive loss to follow-up. We published a paper on uh, uh, childhood cancers in Zambia and, um, and um, to try to find out who, who was diagnosed with cancer and getting what kind of follow-up they had. And we had 90% uh, abandonment of care, 10% of the children diagnosed with cancer at the University Teaching Hospital in Lusaka, Zambia, had optimized care, either, either optimized care to death or optimized care to cure or optimized care as we were doing the study. So, you know, this is the environment we're in. Lack of awareness of preventive health. You know, you have to, you have to educate women to know why to, to, to have a pap smear or to have a VIA. Uh, a lot of inconvenience, embarrassment, fear, and stigma that is not nearly as prominent in the U.S., where there's more of a, a social culture that pap smears are a good thing. You don't have that social culture where nobody's ever heard of a pap smear. Or, or, um, and then financial barriers because people are charging and multiple visits are a problem when you don't have one stop shop because of the transportation challenges. And there are lots of competing public health priorities. So when you go to the ministry and they uh, don't have the money for this, they'll ask you a question, well, should we take it from the vaccine budget? Or should we take it from the antiretroviral therapy budget? Or what about the TB budget? Should we take it from there? And those are the sorts of impossible questions you get asked. So that is the context in which uh, Grosbeck Parham uh, and Melindy Wanahamuntu, who are my GYN collaborators, um, opted for VIA. And when you take vinegar, 5% acetic acid, and paint it on the cervix, you'll get the acetowhitening, acetic, get it, acetowhitening. And it will make it much easier to determine whether this is um, uh, um, normal or abnormal. Uh, it might be a squamous metaplasia. You don't worry about it in adolescent. So there is some training to be able to distinguish an acetowhitening from, say, a, uh, a squamous metaplasia that's normal. Um, and, uh, and that's what the nurses were all about. This was uh, a setup where we used a digital, sort of a homegrown digital cervicography because it was very complex to operationalize uh, culp culpscopes. Very complex. It would have required a much higher level of, of training. So what we had was a high quality camera with very dense pixel. And you take the photograph and what you really need is a really good light. You really need a good 100 watt bulb. And you shine it in the cervix and uh, on the cervix, the nurse takes a picture and instantaneously pops up on the screen with a very high level of uh, fidelity. So I call it the, the poor man or poor woman's colposcope. And what you're doing is functionally the same thing. You are magnifying the cervix so you can actually see the lesions more easily. And there was uh, RCT um, data that came long after we started our study that strongly suggested that you could substantially impact um, cervical cancer rates based on a VIA uh, grounded program. Uh, and, uh, and that was reassuring, although we didn't have those data at the time. These are data that we generated ourselves from uh, India. Uh, and this was my postdoc, uh, who's now at NCI. And uh, we were really quite pleasantly surprised by these data because we looked at sensitivity specificity, was highly competitive with cytologies of various cutoffs. So you were doing uh, as well or possibly even better with VIA than you were with um, uh, pap smear. And this was in an Indian hospital with a sophisticated pathologist. In fact, she was the chair of the department and she was a GYN pathologist and she was doing the pap smear readings. So we, we felt that we had uh, a reasonable comparison group. Now, when we started this, uh, we, we, we did our HIV capacity building in the early uh, noughts, and then we um, hired Grossbeck, who was a, an American um, GYN oncologist. He moved to Zambia and partnered with Mulindi Mwanahamuntu, uh, who immensely talented GYN uh, at the, um, at the uh, University Teaching Hospital at the University of Zambia. And when we got some money, we were able to ramp up our testing. And uh, in about uh, five years in Lusaka, we were able to test uh, about 45,000 women, and you'll see uh, after 2010 in a moment. So this is the cervical cancer prevention program in Zambia that uh, 
that we established. It was a public sector and academic partnership with the Zambian Ministry of Health in the, in the heart of it. Uh, uh, the University Teaching Hospital, which is like uh, their Yale New Haven, it's actually a separate entity from the medical school, and of course the medical school. And then the um, NGO, non-governmental organization that I established in 2000, which was the Center for Infectious Disease Research in Zambia, which is, I'm happy to say, still going strong and has been uh, Zambianized. Now it's controlled not by University of Alabama, where I was at the time, but by, by, um, by the Zambians themselves. And we've had a variety of, of uh, UAB, UNC, NCI, uh, Vanderbilt, uh, I moved to Yale, um, uh, CDC, and particularly the misspelled International Union for Health Promotion Education. Um, again, I'm back to India just to uh, remind you that your yield uh, in HIV-positive women is uh, considerably higher than your yield will be in HIV-negative women. That's the only point of this slide. And, uh, and so now that we're in the triple therapy era for HIV, women live long enough that they can get cervical cancer. So it's almost like a surgeon saying, you know, the, the surgery was successful, the patient died. We don't want our PEPFAR HIV programs to be successful in, in preserving life, and then the patient dies of cervical cancer. That's the whole point of highlighting uh, HIV-infected women front and center, although we have never restricted our programs to HIV-infected women. We just made special efforts to link them to the HIV clinics and make sure that we get all the women, but they've always been open to everybody. So again, you visualize the cervix. You can use Lugol's iodine. It's a little messier, and most people just use the vinegar. And you can get vinegar anywhere. I mean, anywhere in the world you can get vinegar. And, uh, and you need to visualize it carefully. Uh, you need to wait a bit. You know, people will paint the cervix and examine it 10 seconds later. That's not right. It takes a while for the uh, mild uh, acid to, uh, to interact with the um, uh, distorted tissues, so you do have to wait. And the nurses had a timer to force them to wait. They would, they would set the timer, and they'd talk to the patient for a minute, and then they'd look, which is the right way to do it. And, uh, and then we would examine and confirm by diagnostic tests um, as necessary. So uh, basically, um, the screening test uh, VIA, uh, you'll get people at NCI, NCI and elsewhere who don't like VIA. They want us to use HPV screening. And my answer to them is the same every single time. We can do VIA virtually for no cost. And you show me an HPV screen that is anything under than $30 a pop. And now they're, they're, they're making it available in developing countries for like $12 a pop. I mean, they just can't afford $12 a pop for a screening test. You need a screening test that's cheap. And I'm all for HPV screening in the ideal world, and I'm thrilled if point-of-care diagnostics gets the cost down to something that's affordable for Zambia and Mozambique, but right now I think VIA is a better option. And I have knocked down, drag out fights with my friends, actually, at NCI on that exact topic. Um, now, digital cervicography did help uh, enhance the accuracy of our VIA, we think, and also allowed telemedicine support. So we, every time you had a uh, visualization, it was stored in the computer. And on Friday afternoons, all the nurses came in, and um, Grossbeck and Melindy would review all of the slides of the week. And that's how the nurses got better and better and better, because they would say, OK, that you did a crow surgery on, but you know, look at these characteristics. That really, and look at the age of the patient. That really is a squamous metaplasia. That's not a lesion. We can see why you thought it was a lesion, but next time, these are the characteristics that will distinguish it from, from a lesion. And so you didn't need to do that. And that was the kind of feedback. And let me tell you, those sessions on Friday afternoon went faster and faster and faster as the year went on, because the nurses got to be better at this than any resident at Yale, po possibly any gynecologist at Yale. They got expert at this because they were subspecialized in examining the cervix. And they did nothing but examine cervices and get, get this kind of feedback, and they became absolutely excellent. And we actually, uh, when we had tie breaks in, in the current program, when we, when we have some disagreements between the nurses and the doctors, the nurses usually win. They'll point something out to us. Anyway, the treatment of precancer, cryotherapy, you all know, we used to use, you know, 
liquid nitrogen. Now we use gaseous uh, um, uh, freezing, and it's considered to be reasonably safe, uh, locally adaptable. It seems to be acceptable to the thousands of patients we've screened and is quite feasible with sustained training support. Now, you do have to have access to the gas, so it's not necessarily what you use in remote rural Congo. But uh, you certainly can get into the, into the uh, cities, both large and small, and any hospital could theoretically, any hospital that can get uh, oxygen can, ought to be able to get the uh, cryotherapy gases. And then the LEAPS, which does require a technically expert individual to do, uh, preferably a gynecologist, and those we have to refer. And uh, uh, we uh, set that up as we were setting up the program, so we knew we were going to have a lot of uh, leaps that were going to have to be done, and ultimately some surgeries that would have to be done. Now that's basically the equipment for VIA. Got some swabs, cotton puffs, um, you know, cleansers, and vinegar. So it's really, really easy. This is a funny little uh, website that some of you may have seen before. If you go into worldmapper.org and you've got a database of, uh, of global uh, incidence or prevalence rates, depending on what you're talking about, you can, you can, you can do a ge geographic distortion of countries based on their rates, <laughs> which I think is kind of fun. So I should, I'm showing you this to get, let you know uh, the challenge in India with its vast population. And these are actually the country, these are actually numbers of deaths. This is not rates. I misspoke a moment ago. These are actual deaths. And, uh, and because the populations of, Af of Africa are not as vast as they are in India, China, the, the countries don't look as big. But proportionate to their, to their populations, these are really, really big, really, really big dots. I mean, you think about uh, there are only a million people in Swaziland, and you can easily see that dot. So it just gives you a sense of, of where, the, where the real challenges are in terms of screening are really in, uh, in uh, uh, African Asia. This is Grossbeck. Uh, this is Melindy. These are the nurses who are um, the backbone of our cervical cancer program. Uh, we wrote up a paper that I'm proud of. I think this one is, 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 is in the, is in the um, AIDS journal called AIDS, and it, it, it's a pragmatic paper about how to set up a program like this. It's not great science. It's, not a, it's, it's a lessons learned section of AIDS, sort of implementation science. And uh, when we wrote this up, we weren't sure if anybody would publish it. And then we saw this AIDS opportunity, this particular section of AIDS, which was definitely created as a response to PEPFAR, because they were looking for lessons learned from these vast investments, how to do programs better. So if you, if you only want to read one paper, I think this one is probably the best one that uh, was led by Mulindi and my postdoc and my medical student. This is the pathologist, uh, consulting gynecologist myself, uh, Jeff Stringer, who's now heading a, 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 a global GYN program at UNC, and then Beck. So um, just some pictures of what our clinic looked like and our ed uh, community educator who was working the, the various um, waiting rooms of the clinics and the hospitals to try to drum up business try to get women to, after they were done with their appointment and, and a little bit of education, and then uh, our, our Friday afternoon feedback sessions. Uh, I mentioned already the digital uh, cervicography um, and uh, why we thought that was uh, a, a helpful innovation and the fact that it created an electronic medical record by definition because that was now uh, preserved. And we have now been doing a lot of distance consultation more after I left the program uh, and came here, uh, the distance consul consultation has really been a very vibrant component because it, it, PEPFAR has enabled us to roll this out countrywide, and um, and um, it, you just cannot get gynecologists in all of the small cities and towns of Zambia. It's just not going to happen. So uh, how do we cope with that? Well, now we do our consultations with the nurses through the internet. And we're able to give continuing education. We're able to give feedback uh, to uh, empower them to improve their, their uh, quality of care uh, long distance. Also to try to save patients long trips for leaps and uh, biopsies, leaps, and surgeries if we're pretty sure that they don't need it. Um, so, and we've written about that uh, in, in a paper a few years back. Um, 
uh, on digital serpicography and also a paper on telecommunications. That, uh, and so this is updating that older slide where uh, you go from 06 to 13, and now we've had to change this uh, to, you know, you remember we stopped at about 40,000 uh, in about 2010, and, you know, you just, you just keep going up when you have the resources and the sociocultural milieu, the, the, um, the sort of um, sense that community women have about screening. And women start talking to other women and say, you know, it wasn't that bad. And, and they found something and they, they treated it. I think you should go. So there's a lot of uh, beauty parlor communication woman to woman. And I'll tell you honestly, we worked a lot harder in uh, this time period to drum up business than we do now. So there has been a sea change in community attitude towards cervical cancer screening in the country of Zambia. And that is, I don't know, arguably the most gratifying thing of our whole program is that women are now wanting to be screened for cervical cancer. They're appreciating that, yes, their cousin died of cervical cancer, yes, their aunt died of cervical cancer, and now there's something they can do to avoid it in themselves or their loved ones. And that's very exciting to see that. And now we have screened more than 400,000 women. Now, there are uh, probably uh, about 14 million people, uh, half of them under the age of uh, 15. Uh, uh, so that's seven, half of them being women, uh, 3.5. Some of them older, perhaps don't need to be screened. So a good three million women. So we're not there yet. We need, we need, we need a lot more, but this is, this is 400,000 women screened compared to 1,000 or 2,000 uh, when we started the program. So, you know, if you're patient and you get resources, you can make miracles happen. We've done uh, a lot of community or, um, uh, affairs to try to bring, bring the word out to communities, particularly if we're not getting so many people coming into the clinic in a particular neighborhood. We'll do a community fair and drum up business. We'll hire a uh, drama troupe to um, do something that's very popular in Zambia, which is street theater. And that's something people relate to. And then you have a drama, sort of like a live action soap opera. You have a drama where there's something about cervical cancer. And the, and the dramatists are really very talented. They, they, they're very quick pickups. You can educate them about the disease, and then they create a drama around the disease, and it's really quite impressive. It's really quite uh, effective. I, I, I don't ever understand the language because it's either in Nyanja or Bemba or, or, you know, Tonga or Lozi, but I certainly understand the drama and it's, it's uh, my, my, my native language speakers tell me it's dead on accurate in terms of the science. And uh, it enables uh, mass gatherings and uh, local, we often rely on local leaders so a well-known local nurse is giving the talk, or a, a chief, or the chief's wife, or this sort of thing. You get a much better audience than one of us comes in. You have simultaneous translation, so you know you can imagine. And and you know you just look at the faces of the women who are paying attention. You get a sense that that they're that they're very interested. Um, so um, that that was the acknowledgement of the of the pictures. <laughs> I don't know how it ended up on another slide. Um, we, we, we wrote this paper also sort of as a summary paper of the first 100,000 patients. And this is also, I think, if you're going to read two papers, you might want to read this one too. Uh, and uh, and uh, what really uh, was exciting was when the PEPFAR uh, ambassador, Dr. Eric Goosby, who was the ambassador before the current ambassador who headed the PEPFAR program in the Office of Global AIDS Coordination, uh, when uh, uh, Dr. Goosby, who was from UCSF, um, learned the details of our program, he thought it was a big deal, and uh, he recruited Tony Fauci and uh, a famous uh, African women's leader and, uh, and the moderate moderator, and they held a uh, 2011 uh, launching ceremony for a collaboration between the George W. Bush Institute the Komen Global Alliance and UNAIDS, along with probably seven or eight other partners, um, for the so-called Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon campaign. And uh, Pink Ribbon, Red Ribbon is to take the red ribbon of AIDS, right, and the pink ribbon of breast cancer and 
try to use these HIV infrastructures that have been, created opportunities for chronic care management all over the world in places where the only utility of the local clinics was acute care management. Nobody ever got an appointment for a follow-up. In, in vast swaths of Asia and Africa, even Latin America, you don't go for chronic care management. You go for acute care. That's it. Nobody gets an appointment. And um, HIV has given people follow-up appointments. We, we now have the infrastructures in very improbable rural settings to do this. And the cancer community realized, wait a minute, this is a piggyback opportunity. Let's start with breast cancer screening, cervical cancer screening, other screening. Let's even use these AIDS clinics as a way to get cancer drugs to the patient when we know that the patient is never going to make a four-hour, eight-hour trip back to the capital city of the cancer hospital because they can't afford to lose the day in their fields. These are subsistence farmers. They're not going to take a day out and bring their child or bring themselves for radiation therapy treatment or chemotherapy treatment. And so it's, a, it's the mentality that perhaps this HIV system could be used for other chronic diseases. And that's where Pink Ribbon, Red, Rib, Red Ribbon comes from. They've got an uh, informative website if you're interested. Um, so we want to develop cancer prevention treatments in low and middle income countries. And we think it's very smart to piggyback on ongoing global health implementation programs. We have to do task shifting to nurses and clinical clinician support by telemedicine. This is not negotiable. This is not something I want to debate with an OBGYN and they say that the nurses are not qualified to do it. That those people don't, don't work in these countries. They don't realize there are no people to do this. So we have no choice but to do the task shifting. And frankly, we want to do task shifting even from the nurses to community health workers and try to preserve the nurses' time to, to, to be elite clinicians, if you will. Um, you know, maybe you don't have to do that in Brazil. And maybe, maybe you, you don't have to do that in, um, in uh, Russia, where they've got a surfeit of doctors. They just need to train their doctors better. But in the parts of Africa where you have some of the lowest doctor um, um, uh, to patient ratios in the world, um, uh, then you need to think about nurses and other, other uh, cl clinicians. For example, in the former um, British colonies, they have a, 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 a position called the, the clinical officer. And these are um, people who may be high school graduates and they t have three more years of training. They're a little bit analogous to our physician's assistants, although they are not nearly as well trained as a physician's assistant who requires you know, college training and then three years so, or two years. So uh, I don't want to the, take that analogy too far, but ultimately they are uh, physician extenders and those people can also be trained in some of these areas. Uh, community mobilization, peer-to-peer -peer support systems. If you build it, they may not come. So you have to do the community work. Uh, and building capacity for cancer therapy, uh, the old adage, don't screen if you can't treat, is also compelling. The bottom line, uh, lives can be saved with sustained efforts at modest cost. And uh, ultimately, we need HPV vaccines to turn off the tap. And that's my reminder of the bathtub that's overflowing. I mean, I can, I can take my little, little bucket and keep scooping water out of the bathtub, but if the, if the water is flowing, you know, full speed, and, and that's where I see, you know, vaccines, you turn off the spigot. Uh, and, uh, and happily, we're seeing some movement in HPV in developing countries now. So uh, just a word, Zambia has taken this on. And thanks to Gavi, uh, which uh, used to be called the Global Alliance for Vaccines and Immunizations, now they just call themselves Gavi, um, and uh, very heavily funded by the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation, as well as international organizations like uh, USAID and uh, DFID, which is the British equivalent, and NORAD, which is the Norwegian equivalent, and a host of other uh, donor agencies. Um, coverage is improving, a little slower than we would like, but we're getting HPV vaccine into developing countries in a way we never uh, used to. And uh, we're seeing reduced HPV infection rates in countries like ours in certain circumstances where that's being carefully studied. And obviously, we need improved quality of care in all these settings. So going back in time again with one of our earlier papers, um, this was a bit of a surprise when we looked at genotypes. And this was our 16 and 18 pool. And we had uh, 35. We had. Uh, 
uh, 45, we had uh, 58, et cetera. And this was this and much many other, I don't know if the vaccine developers ever, ever even read this paper, but if they did, it would have supported their development of non-avalent vaccine. So if you really want a uh, widespread applicable vaccine for global use, you're going to have to acknowledge that in some countries you've got greater diversity of the oncogenic uh, HPV types and you may need a non-avalent vaccine. So unfortunately, the quadrivalent is cheaper and there's some uh, uh, manufacturing holdups on non-avalent. So a lot of what's being promulgated is quadrivalent. We would very much rather see the non-avalent promulgated internationally. So uh, over 400,000 uh, screened by last month. We now have a gynecologic oncology unit. PEPFAR helped build that. Uh, we have specialists in training, Zambians. Uh, and uh, sadly, uh, you know, we still have cervical cancer rates, but we're getting a lot more early stage disease than we did 15 years ago. Um, we have a chemo radiation center, which was new in Zambia. They didn't have any radiation therapy at all until recently. And 30% of the cases seen are cervical cancer. Survival at two years is still less than 40%. So for the high-end cancers, we're still seeing them too late. And uh, a new thrust, government thrust through mobilization. Just to remind you, the communication social mobilization, we do meet regularly with the Ministry of Education on the vaccine agenda because we want to use schools uh, for vaccines, media orientation, tremendous investments of time and money into social mobilization. Um, and uh, gender and equity considerations that make it easier in rural or urban areas than the rural, make it easier in in school than out of school, and make it easier in HIV. Ironically, in this case, it's easier to do an HIV positives because we actually see them than HIV negatives. And there are all sorts of debates about three versus two dose consideration that I don't have time to go into. Just to show you now, it's organized in Zambia. There's a national cancer coordinator. That's new. Uh, deputy coordinator, and we're very proud to say that Sharon Kapemwe, which, whom we trained, who was part of our program, has been named as the chief of the secondary prevention unit. Three-phase national uh, scale-up, uh, the pro provincial the provincial hospitals, the district hospitals, and the health facilities. Probably should have shown you this at the beginning so you know where, Zamb where Zambia is. And that was the screening in 2006, our program in Lusaka. And this is the screening today. Only uh, the red areas don't have substantial screening areas, and uh, the blue um, have substantial availability green as well. So we have made progress in cervical cancer prevention and uh, management in Zambia. It is possible to do this in, in, in a decade. Uh, I won't lie to you. Uh, we would have had trouble doing this without PEPFAR. If we hadn't had the AIDS investments, and Eric Goosby hadn't been a little bit more of an enlightened uh, ambassador. Uh, he's a physician, AIDS doc from San Francisco, and he appreciated that it didn't make sense for him to save lives with antiretroviral investments and then cost those lives with cancer deaths. So he, he liberalized what we could use the funding for and permitted us to use some of the funding for a cervical cancer program development. And, uh, and uh, not every ambassador has seen it that way. So I want to acknowledge the people who helped me with the slides, the nurses who are the backbone of this, the funders, uh, including NCI, um, the uh, ICMR, which is the Indian equivalent of the NIH, and, and NARI, the National AIDS Research Institute in India, and the Zambian MOH. And uh, a few of our, our references are here if those are of some interest. So happy to take any questions or comments you might have. Thanks.